Uh, this is uh, Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under. As my health slowly declines, I'm finding it harder to collect my thoughts. And so it's becoming more important for me to do so. You might call it my, uh, my legacy. As I've said before, I've had to reassess my assumptions uh, with new information that comes my way uh, several times in the last 10 years. When I've done that in the last year or so, I was described as insane because I expressed opinions that took me away from the tribe I was in, and I'm sure you'll know what I'm talking about, and I started to play around and that's the essence I began to play around with new ideas. Indeed I was just asking questions according to what I was seeing and that rendered me insane because it put me uh, in conflict with their um, their views. So to me the insistence on seeing new information and filtering it through the ideas of ideology that has never changed over time. The ideas formed in youth provide the prism through which I see everything. Without ever reassessing or even questioning one's assumptions, it is much closer to a definition of insanity than anything uh, that I may guilty, be guilty of. Very little of what I say represents a fixed opinion. It may be a considered opinion, but mostly they are reflections. And I don't expect anyone to agree with me, but I would love to provoke people into thinking about things for themselves. I'm deeply worried by the rapid changes in America which appears to be disintegrating before our very eyes. We're just days away from the election. Uh, and I am very much for social justice and against wars, wars for resources or attempts to control other countries, all the while denying others the right to exercise the same rights in their own spheres of influence. Now that's the very definition of uh, American imperialism. And I will continue to oppose that. However, Thinking in a more reflective way, there is another way of thinking about this. And uh, yeah, when I heard the following from John Cleese, I had to admit that he was right, at least in part. But I think it's very, I mean, everyone's on about British imperialism at the moment. And I'm reading a couple of books by uh, Harari, um, by uh, Noah Harari. I yeah. always forget his first name. And he's pointing out that basically empires have been the way of organizing the world for something like four and a half thousand years. So if you're suddenly going to say this is very wicked, you have to say, well, everything in the last four and a half thousand years was a bit wicked. The fact is that the history of the world is basically a history of crime. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a question of any strong nation was always bullying the weak ones around it. That's not the nasty side of human nature. To try and pretend that the nastiness is all concentrated in the British Empire, which was actually a lot better run than a lot of the other empires, compare it with Belgium, for example. People who are trying to pretend that all the wickedness are in it, no, as, as uh, Noah Harari says, many good things came out of the empire. You, what I'm completely against is any kind of thinking that says this is all good or this is all bad. That is paranoia. That's the definition of paranoia. And what we need to see is everything spread over a spectrum. Yes, there were all empires everywhere because that was the way the world was. But some were a bit better than others and some were worse than others. And on that spectrum, it's interesting to talk. But the whole idea, we've got to wrap up four and a half thousand years of human history because a few young people in the last 10 years have decided it should be God. It's patently absurd. 
I'm sure that many Indians or Africans might not agree with uh, John's assessment of the British Empire, although it does not compare with the brutality of the Belgians. Similarly, I don't think that the people of Iraq, or for that matter Afghanistan, Iran or Syria, or any number of nations, um, would agree with that assessment when it comes to the American Empire either. However, John Cleese is right that empire and the subjugation of small nations by big ones has been with us since the year dot. I've come to agree with much of the analysis of the folk at True News. However, I often bristle whenever they mention uh, a communist revolution in America, and especially when they appear to justify the McCarthy witch hunts. Uh, to my mind, that f flies in the face of how I see history. Uh, but I'm quite willing to reassess. And um, the circumstances that we find ourselves in have dictated that I leave ideas of progressivism and the left behind me, but I have not adopted the ideas of the right. I've never been a fan of Trump, uh, might seem that way, um, with what I post and say, but it's not the case, and it never has been. It's a disgust with the endless corruption and criminality of the dem Democrats and the hidden hand, the deep state that has driven me. I've always said that if Trump didn't exist, someone else would have had to have invented him. So this is a rather pre-deterministic view of history. Uh, when the time comes, history seems to throw up those leaders who can expedite the process of collapse, whether it be Louis the 14th or Nicholas the second of Russia or Trump. Uh, so these countries are probably ripe for or, or, or dynasties are ripe for um, collapse. But history seems to throw up figures that kind of act to accelerate this. So to get an understanding of this point of view that there have been moles, especially in American academia and in journalism, who have brainwashed the whole generation, I decided to listen to an old 1984 interview with Soviet KGB defector Yuri Bismenov, who represents this world view very well. And... Um, I've heard this, it's not new, this is very, very common with older older Russians, and um, I do believe there is a reason why hardly anyone with a memory of living in the USSR who is not on the right of the political spectrum, uh, they've had their fill of, of, of revolutions and, and um, kind of progressivism. Um, so let's just uh, listen to uh, Yuri Bezmenov and what he says about um, the Soviet Union and about especially the journalists who kind of went along uh, with uh, Soviet propaganda. Mr. Bezmenov, uh, we've read a lot about the concentration camps and the slave labor camps under the Stalin regime. Now the general impression in America is that those things are part of the past. Are they still going on today, or what is the yes. status? Yes. There is no qualitative change in, in the Soviet concentration camp system. Uh, there are changes in, in numbers of prisoners. Again, this is uh, un unreliable Soviet statistics. We don't know how many political prisoners are there in the Soviet concentration camps. But we sure know from, from various sources 
that at each uh, particular time there are close to uh, 25 to 30 million of Soviet citizens who are virtually kept as slaves in forced labor camp system. The size of the population of a uh, ca country like Canada is serving terms as, as prisoners. Incredible. So um, I would say that th those intellectuals who try to convince American public that concentration camp system is a thing of a past are either conscientiously misleading public opinion or they are not in very intellectual people. They, they're selectively blind. They don't, they lack um, intellectual honesty when they say that. Famous for supporting the Soviet system. Uh, as long as the Soviet junta will keep on receiving credits, money, technology, grain deals and political recognition from all these traitors of democracy or freedom, uh, there is no hope, there is not much hope for, for changes I I in my country and the system will not collapse by itself simply because it's, it's being nourished by so-called American imperialism. This is the greatest paradox in history of mankind when uh, capitalist world supports and actively nourishes its own destru destroyer, destructor. Well, this interview was filmed back in 1984. As we know, the Soviet Union did collapse in uh, 1990, and not just of its own accord, but also with considerable help from the United States. Um, so I don't see that what he's saying is totally true. However, there's a lot to be gleaned from this interview, and you'll see uh, from the following segments, he's very down on Americans who, in his word, have been duped, and the role played in this by academics and by the media. Uh, they were submitted, uh, the, this Novosti Press Agency developed so-called backgrounders, 20-25 pages of information and opinions which were presented to the journalists even before they bought their tickets to Moscow. They had to analyze the situation and judging on their reaction to that backgrounder, the local Novosti representative or local Soviet diplomat in Washington DC would assess whether they have, whether they be given visa to USSR or not. Yeah, so but they were selected ahead oh, of yes, time. They were, they were pre-selected very carefully and uh, there is not much chance for honest journalists to arrive to USSR and to stay there for one year and to bring this uh, package of lies back home. Why would they stubbornly bring lies to their own population through their own mass media? I have various answers to this. There is not a single explanation. It's a complex of explanations. It's fear, pure biological fear. They understand that they are on the territory of an enemy state, a police state. And just to save their rotten skins and their miserable jobs, their affluence back home, they would prefer to tell a lie than to, to ask truthful questions and, and report truthful information. Second, most of these schmucks were uh, afraid to lose their jobs because obviously if you tell truth about my country you will not last long as a correspondent of New York Times uh, or, or Los Angeles Times they will fire you what kind of correspondent are you you obviously cannot find common language with Russians if they kick you out in 24 hours so just by by trying to be conformist to their own editorial bosses they tried not to offend the sentiments of the Soviet administrators and people like myself Deep inside, I hope they would insult my uh, or offend my sentiments. Obviously, they preferred not to. Uh, another reason, uh, I, did, I, I refuse to believe it, but obviously, there is another reason. Obviously, it's a greed. These people earn a lot of money. When they come back to USA, they claim that they are experts on my country. They write books which sells in million copies, titled like Russians, The Truth About Russia. Most of it is lie about Russia, yet they claim to be Sovietologists. They, they, bring, they play back myths about my country, the propaganda cliches, yet they are stubbornly resist a, a, the word of truth. If a, a person like Solzhenitsyn 
is either defecting or kicked out of USSR. They try all their best to, dis to discredit him and to discourage him. Non-existent uh, harmony. Obviously, it's more beneficial for the Soviet aggressors to have a bunch of duped Americans than Americans who are self-conscious, healthy, uh, physically fit, and alert to, to the reality. I think a lot of this is historical. Um, this interview was recorded back in 1984. It's all 34 years ago. So the people that he's talking about are either dead or very old. Well, there might be the odd, um, uh, you know, academics still in universities from that period, uh, but I don't think so. Um, I have no I, sense of American academia and what they're teaching, but uh, I do have an idea from uh, kind of everything that's been said in the media. If we translate this to present day reality, and to be clear, I'm certainly not talking about present day Russia and the myths of Russiagate. Um, that's just a, a Democrat Party myth. Then Bezmenov has some things to say about useful idiots and what would await them if ever the socialist revolution was to succeed um, in the United States. Obviously, they were very much fascinated. They were convinced that that type of, of, of brainwashing is very efficient and instrumental in demoralization of the United States, Soviet socialist or communist or whatever system. When they get disillusioned, they become the worst enemies. That's why my KGB instructors specifically made the point, never bother with leftists. Forget about these political prostitutes. Aim higher. This was my instruction. Try to get into, into uh, large circulation established conservative media. Rich, filthy rich movie makers, intellectuals, so-called academic circles. Cynical, egocentric people who can look into your eyes with angelic expression and tell you a lie. These are the most recruitable people, people who lack moral principles, who are either too greedy or too uh, suffer from self-importance. Uh, they feel that uh, they, they matter a lot. Uh, these are the people who KGB wanted very much to recruit. There's a little difficulty in um, seeing that this relates to the um, present day, um, but I have more difficulty um, in seeing what he's talking about, because, simply because what happened historically, the Soviet Union, uh, did collapse, and American society, you know, apart from that process which is well underway of of uh, of disintegration, was still pretty robust. So that any um, kind of Soviet destabilization was not likely to be that successful. But to eliminate the others, to execute the others, don't they serve some purpose? Wouldn't they be the no, ones they, they rely they on? they serve purpose only at the stage of destabilization of a nation. For example, your leftists in, in United States, all these professors and all these beautiful civil rights defenders, they are instrumental in the process of the, of the uh, uh, subversion only to destabilize the nation. When their job is completed, they are, non, they are not needed anymore. They know too much. Some of them, when, when they get disillusioned, when they see that Marxist-Lenin has come to power, they, obviously they get offended. They think that they will come to power. That will never happen, of course. They will be lined up against the wall and shot. But they may turn into the most bitter enemies of Marxist-Leninists when they come to power. I just um, have to ask myself whether what he's describing here uh, fits uh, Chinese activities. Uh, especially in relation to um, what's been revealed in the past few weeks and months. When uh, the Soviets use the phrase ideological subversion, what do they mean by it? Ideological subversion is, is the process which is legitimate, overt, and open. You, you can see it with your own eyes. All, all you have to do, all American mass media has to do is to unplug their bananas from their ears, open up their eyes, and they can see it. There is no mystery. There is nothing to do with espionage. But in reality, 
the main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of it intelligence at all. According to my uh, opinion and opinion of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money, and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, active мероприятия in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The result, the result you can see, most of the people who graduated in the 60s, dropouts or half-baked intellectuals, are now occupying the positions of power in the government, civil service, business, mass media, educational system. You are stuck with them. You cannot get rid of them. They are contaminated. They are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind. Even if you, if you expose them to authentic information, even if you prove that white is white and black is, uh, is black, you still cannot change the basic perception and the logic of behavior. In other words, these people, uh, uh, the process of demoralization is complete and irreversible. To get rid society of these people, you, have, you need another 20 or, or, or 15 years to educate a new generation of patriotically minded and, and, and uh, common, common sense people who would be acting in favor and in the interests of, of the uh, of the United States society. Uh, Biesmenov makes no bones as to what he thinks will await all the politicians, all the journalists, and indeed um, what Biesmenov would call useful idiots, that's a term of, of Lenin, of all the leftists, the anarchists uh, of Antifa, um, once the revolution they are espousing succeeds. And yet these people who've been programmed and, as you say, in place, and yes. who are favorable to an opening with the Soviet concept, mm -hmm. these are the very people who would be marked for extermination in this country? Most of them, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, simply because the psychological shock, when, when they will see in future what the, what the beautiful society of equality and social justice means in practice, Obviously, they will revolt. They, 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 will, uh, they, they will be very unhappy, frustrated people. And the Marxist-Leninist regime does not tolerate these people. Uh, they, obviously, they will join the links of dissenters, mm -hmm. dissidents. Yes. Uh, unlike in present United States, there will be no place for dissent in, in future Marxist-Leninist America. He also makes it clear that this is all possible due to the moral disintegration of the United States over many years. Previously, not even Comrade Andropov and, and all his experts would, would even dream of such a tremendous success. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans, thanks to lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. 
When a military boot crashes his then he will understand, but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation of demoralization. So basically America is stuck with, with demoralization and unless, even if, if you start right now, here, this minute, you start educating new generation of Americans, it will still take you 15 to 20 years to turn the tide of, uh, of ideological perception of reality uh, back to normal, no, normalcy and, and uh, patriotism. The next stage is destabilization. This time, subverter does not care about your ideas and the patterns of your consumption. Whether you eat junk food and get fat and flab, it doesn't matter anymore. He'd be talking about right now, couldn't he? You listen to this. The, the time bomb is ticking. With every second, the disaster is coming closer and closer. Unlike myself, you will have nowhere to defect to. Unless you want to live in Antarctica with penguins. And the solution he suggests is the same all the time. Well, I suspect it is too late because we're already in the eye of the storm. So basic, two, two very simple, maybe two simplistic answers or solutions, but never, nevertheless, they are the only solutions. Educate yourself, understand what's going on around you. You are not living at the time of peace. You are in a state of war. And you have precious little time to save yourself. And so, what do I make of all of this? Well, I think there's a lot there that is one man's opinion that relates to something that was relevant to history of 40 to 50 years ago. The Soviet Union has passed, and I'm not sure how much of the disintegration that we have seen in America since the 1950s, 60s, can be put down to foreign influence. Um, there are a lot of other explanations as well. Uh, we can see the role of, say, for example, institutions like the Tavistock Institute in London. And this is how uh, it's described. This book uh, describes how a complex nexus of institutions spread and implement an agenda of social destruction through drug abuse, new age mysticism and the occult, um, a brainwashing mass media and a perverted cybernetics program. Tavistock itself was Britain's premier psychological warfare centre, working in it allegiance with some of the world's leading sociologists, psychiatrists anthropologists, the so-called psychiatric shock troops of despair. There's Nazi witch doctors, war, assassinations, a whacked out generation of hippies, now intergenerational drug abusers, CIA, and plenty of the cultural elite that go towards making up this uh, hocus, ho hocus pocus. And in addition to that, uh, for instance, the documentary series The Century of Self also shows clearly how the public relations industry played a role in all of these changes. So, um, well, that doesn't come from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Um, so only so much can come from foreign interference. Organizations like the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the KGB, and now the Chinese Communist Party can only exploit the inner weaknesses of a society. The CTP can do nothing unless there are powerful and hugely corrupt members of the ruling class that are willing to be compromised uh, by bribes of the like that we've seen in the Hunter um, Hunter Biden laptop scandal revelations. There is a major part of what Bismenov is warning. This is a major part of what Bismenov is warning us of. These people, like the Bidens and much of the elite, are traitors. And now, days out from the 2020 election, the situation is orders of magnitude more serious than what Bezmanov is warning us of. Here we are, and the CPSU and the KGB ceased to exist 30 years ago.
So from a fairly naive view of the world, I've come to see that there is good and evil, although it is not that simple as can be seen from this quote from someone who knew what evil is better than most, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, in his book The Gulag Archipelago. And he says, If only it was that simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? So for all of that, I've come to be much more comfortable with a good versus evil and concepts as such as demonic possession. And I realise that there are those who are not. So I'd just like to leave you with an alternative vision uh, that comes from New Age philosophy. So I recall the idea that came from the Maharishi, Mahesh Yogi, from the 90, late 1960s and 70s, that if a certain proportion of the population meditated, then a positive transformation could come about. So turn this on its head and think what happens when these good vibes are replaced by negative ones. When these energies predominate, then we see the very obverse of what the Maharishi was saying, and that these thought patterns have the opposite effect. I think that's another explanation, perhaps for what I'm talking about, a society that has not only uh, lost its way, but is actively accepting evil, and a sufficient number of people are subject, subject to demonic possession to poison the whole society. In the words of Rick Wiles, disaster can only be averted if the whole nation repents of its sins. And that is language that I'm finding easier to accept with every passing day. Um, so to conclude, um, I would just like to uh, finish with an article that was written by Gary of the um, the great uh, wobble, the big wobble, um, and we all know him because he reports regularly on um, on environment and uh, extreme weather events and the sort. Uh, his language is not one, exactly one what I would use, but I'm just going to present this to you. So he says, uh, to really understand something is to be liberated from it. Yet, how can we liberate ourselves from our vain attempt at grow global progress, which has in all intents and purposes destroyed the very place we live in. So let's just read what he has to say. I read somewhere, to really understand something is to be liberated from it. Yet how can we liberate ourselves from our vain attempt at global progress, which has in all intents and purposes destroyed the very place we live in. Our world is collapsing an implosion on a scale unimaginable. And our environment is collapsing just as severely as our society. Our resources are dwindling at an alarming rate. Billions of animals have been lost this year to wildfires, drought, heat, cold, flood, disease, neglect, overfarming, and natural disasters. Many millions of birds are dying around the world due to lack of food, lack of fish and insects. Crops are failing on a biblical scale across the world from the same reasons above. We're beginning to see many areas of the world becoming impossible to live in, areas which for years have been heavily populated and teeming with life 
and vegetation, but are now for certain parts of the year at least unlivable, mainly due to extreme weather events. To make matters worse, the coronavirus has hit the world hard. However, somehow it hit the West even harder. The virus has burst a new pandemic which has already taken root and is quickly spreading its tentacles around the world. This new pandemic did not start in China. This pandemic started in the West, in America of all places. The new pandemic is called civil disorder and will hit us all much harder than COVID in the months to come. Dark forces are at work and infecting people with hate on an unprecedented level, violence, hatred, and ugliness are spewing forth from people who have been dumbed down for years. A silent pent up anger has been boiling up inside people and COVID-19 has brought that anger to the surface. We are fighting flesh and blood, but evil in high places. Water and food insecurity will hit next as millions of jobs are lost and the hard-working people of our society, the honest people, find themselves homeless and out on the streets. They are the victims of democracy and plutocracy. Our banking system, fat and bloated from an $8.5 trillion bailout in 2005, paid by the very people who they are now refusing to help. Democracy is killing the poor, but socialism is protecting the rich. While there should be enough for everyone, the obese are being fattened up by the undernourished. For the few, plundering the poor has become a way of life. Frederick Bastiat wrote, when plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men in a society, over the course of time, they create for themselves a legal system that authorizes it and a moral code that glorifies it. This is what is happening in the West. The rich and the poor have become different species. However, just as the invention of the printing machine in 1440 took away knowledge from the few and gave it to the many, so is the internet educating billions, learning what we're being told by our leaders is really what we should be opposing. And so this is where we find our world in 2020. The poor are learning to fight back, only to find there is nothing left to fight for. So I repeat that, the poor are learning to fight back, only to find that there's nothing left to fight for. The riots prove urban unrest is a class war and a race war and is being politicized by the contenders of the upcoming election. The insanity on the streets is like nothing before. The inequality on the streets is insane. Billionaires and millionaires populate cities where poor, undereducated people roam the streets in abject poverty, homelessness, shoeless, and toothless. Their only interest in life is to find their next high. An obesity pandemic has hit the dumbed down, poverty ridden lower class, blissfully unaware their lifestyle is an early death sentence. The fat and the greedy have plundered everything, and now the people are saying, Enough is enough. The internet is teaching the poor, teaching radicals, militants, anarchists, terrorists, and rebels alike. We have arrived in a strange world where businesses are closed but open to looters. You punish the cops but not the anarchists. We are not allowed to visit our dying elderly, but we are allowed to fly on a crowded jet. We can't go to a ball game, but we can go to a political rally. An uprising is here, 
and will explode after the American election, an explosion which will reverberate around the world like a massive earthquake as we, the people, enter a brave new world. So that's a moral interpretation of events as they are unfolding. And um, I can find very little in there uh, that I could ever take exception to.